welcome everyone to ChessLecture.com. My name is International Master Bill Paschal. It's my special pleasure today to bring you a chess video presentation that we have to consider a little bit different than everything else we've done so far. Today I'm going to present one of my own games played in recent tournament practice that I find very instructional from the practical level. The reason I want to show you my own game, nothing about ego, about wanting to show off, but this is purely an exercise in being able to illustrate everything that goes through the mind of a master level player from the horse's mouth himself. So I'm going to show you what I was thinking when I physically played a game, and this can be very beneficial. It's worked with my students to a great degree of success. The game that I'd like to show you today, I played with the white pieces. This was played in Budapest this year, 2005. My opponent, women's grandmaster and men's international master, Iveta Radziewicz from Poland. Enjoy the game, everyone. With white, as I often do, I played knight to f3 on the first move. This isn't necessarily the strongest move. I don't argue it's better than e4 or d4. It has a lot of transpositional values that you might have learned from some of our other video presentations by people like I am David Vigorito talking about move orders in the opening. Knight f3 is a very good move. You might want to lure a particular opponent into a certain opening but not necessarily going directly for it. So I was worried if I played e4 right away, my opponent, Ms. Razievich, has a couple different defenses that she plays. And maybe one of them, for example, the modern defense I would be comfortable playing against. But she also plays the main line of the dragon defense in a Sicilian, something that I'm not that well prepared for. So I'm waiting to see what she does. She played 1c5. See, if she had played g6, for example, right away, with that modern defense move order, she couldn't get into the dragon defense that I didn't want to play against. So I saw c5 here. If I play e4 now, she plays d6, and I've gotten transposed into a line of Sicilian I'm not really prepared to play against. So I didn't want to go into that. I played c4. So I'm also versed in English opening willing to play c4. Now she played g6. Now she can no longer play a kind of pure dragon. So I played e4. She can play the dragon, but only what's called the accelerated dragon, an opening that I play myself, and I know the ins and outs of that very, very well, and I know the limitations for black. So I was hoping she would transpose to that. So I played e4, and she played bishop g7. And here I played d4. And 99% of the time, this position transposes to one of two openings. Either the accelerated dragon, Roxy bind variation after c takes d, knight takes d4, we have that Roxy bind. Or black plays a move like d6 and allows transposition to the Benoni defense after d5. That's what I kind of expected from this opponent. Instead, she played an interesting move that I've never had to face in a tournament game before, maybe not even in Blitz, queen to b6. And here's a piece of practical advice. When you encounter a move that you've never played or studied or prepared for in the opening, your opponent may be very well versed and may have even prepared it specifically for you. Who knows, as was the case in my game. I recommend a couple of practical things. Don't go for the most complex lines. Because in the most complex lines, I think there could be some traps that your opponent might have just prepared for you. So my practical advice is when you don't know, err on the side of caution and play something straightforward. Can't be bad. Maybe it's not the best move. I spent about 15 minutes on this position, and I spent a long time thinking about knight c3. But knight c3... Although it's a good move, it gets very, very complex. After knight c3, c takes d4, knight to d5, queen a5 check, b4, 
queen back to d8. Knight takes d4. Black plays a move like e6. And I just didn't really know what to make of this position. This is why I spent 15 minutes on one move. It's very strange. The bishop looks dangerous. My rook is a little bit exposed on the long diagonal. But you know why I didn't play it? Not because objectively I think that white has problems here. Because she might know this position better than me. So I decided to stay out of something she might know very well. So we're going back now to move five for white, where I made the practical decision to play a move that's probably not as strong as knight c3, not as correct, safer. So I played d takes c5. She played, of course, queen takes c5. And now I was still out of book. I haven't prepared for queen b6. It's a rare move. In a recent game, in the recent, recent informator, the Yugoslav uh, sh shock informator, White won a nice game between Grandmasters Yermolinsky and Kudrin with a move Bishop E2. I think this was played in Reno, maybe even this year. But, I mean, I didn't really know the theory that well, per se. The reason White plays Bishop E2 is to delay what I played in the game, Knight C3. I played Knight C3, I expect her to play something like D6, and that will have a normal kind of structure similar to other variations like the Marazzi variation. Well, she played bishop takes c3 check. I was stunned at first. I was absolutely stunned at first. But then I said, wow, knight for bishop, you know, that's a beautiful bishop. She just took my knight to damage my pawn structure. I was shocked, but then I was thinking, and, you know, I've played this kind of thing before myself. This is a completely valid defense for black. It's excellent if you're playing for a win. The idea is this. Objectively, the bishop is stronger than the knight. But the damage that you flicked on the enemy's pawn structure compensates for trading off that strong piece. Why would you want to do this, though? Is it good? Is it the best move? I don't know. I really don't know. But I think if you're playing for a win, it's a good idea to sharpen the game. And she was playing for a win. She creates a more dynamic position, double-edged. Bishop takes c3, b takes c3, knight c6. Now I played a move that exploits the potential of my position. What is the upside of the double pawns for white? You might have seen this in my double pawn lecture. Those of you that are looking at and viewing the beginner's uh, category lectures, I did, a, I did a lecture on the benefits of doubled pawns. Open files, right? Half open files. Even Fritz agrees with my move, rook b1, as being the best move for white. It ties black down to b7. It activates the rook, creates threats of even trapping the queen in some lines. Look at this. If black plays d6, double question mark, rook b5, black loses a queen immediately. Is that nice or what? Anyway, this is going to be a little bit of a long lecture. It's a deeply annotated game, so bear with me. I'm going to try to keep it moving, but we're going to take a look at every point. So now rook b1, queen a5. This is a key move. Look, the queen has scope. It can retreat back to d8, b6, c7. It also has threats on the a pawn. It also has squares, many more squares. You don't want the piece to get trapped, so she immediately comes back to a5 and also attacks c3. Now, black has to be a little careful. In some lines, taking c3 can be dangerous. It might open the a1, h8 diagonal for my dark squared bishop. Here is where I played the first new move in this position. Okay, normally, normally queen c2 has been played. This position has maybe only been reached in tournament practice three or four times. Not all the strong players, mind you, played bishop takes c3 either. So queen a5, I play queen d2. This is a new move, and it's interesting. Defense of the c3 for a couple of reasons that actually really come into play in the game. After queen d2, there are two points to this rather than queen c2. All right, I'm really thinking about bishop a3 later on. If the queen should leave a5. Sometimes the bishop's good there. So it may not need this diagonal. 
to h6. But more importantly, I'm thinking about the dark squares around the black king and getting my queen in those dark squares, potentially. So this was the idea. Queen d2. Now, one last point, little point I have to mention, another reason why it might be good. Some lines I might even maneuver knight d4 to c2 to e3 into d5. This is very long-winded, and we have a lot of arrows on the board. It might be confusing, but the idea is knight f3 to d4 to c2 to e3 to d5 possible maneuver. I keep the c2 square free. So queen d2, knight f6. Now bishop d3, of course, defending the pawn at e4. What else can I do? d6 for black, white castles. Now, it's st similar structures. Grandmaster, a certain grandmaster once told me a good piece of advice. When you play these lines with bishop takes knight on c3, normally you don't want a castle after you've done that because you have a very concrete long-term weakness on the dark squares around your king and actually you can be in grave danger there I've seen strong players like Alexander Ivanov and others play such positions with the king in the center making maneuvers like knight d7 knight to c5 keeping the king in the center keeping the options open to castle either way or even just remain in the center but I think my opponent made a practical mistake here castling routinely because now she's committed now I know where to attack and my queen in some lines is going to slide into h6 create threats she didn't really believe that I had realistic threats she was thinking only in terms of pawn structure I am very well oriented with playing for pawn structure in fact that's my normal style this time I played a little bit out of my normal style, but it was refreshing to do something a little bit different. So, rook b5, number one reason for rook b5, preventing possible lateral defense by the queen across the fifth rank. If I'm playing for something like queen h6, I don't want her trading queens with a move like queen h5. So, rook b5, her queen drops back to c7, where it's well placed, it's safe, it can also put pressure on the C pawn. The double C pawns are my long-term liability here. Queen C7. And now here, computer program recommends this move C5. If you put it into Fritz, you know, it sees double pawns, have to get rid of double pawns, very computer-like thinking. And actually, I looked at C5 for quite a bit, and I wasn't happy with C5. It solves the problem of the double pawns, but it doesn't make my position all that great. After c5, if I play that, I undouble the pawns, true. But d takes c5, rook takes c5, b6, black gets to make a developing move for free, for example. Now, where do you put the rook? I don't know. I don't like b5. c4 feels awkward. Everything feels a little bit awkward here. The other thing about c5 that's not so great is that, okay, I've undoubled my pawns. I've gone to great lengths to do that. But I still have a bad pawn structure. I still have an isolated pawn at c3, isolated pawn at a2. I haven't really cured my strategic long-term problems, so I decided not to even bother with that. So I forgot about c5. I like the attacking potential of the rook on the fifth rank. I want to make something here tactically. So I played this move, queen, not this move, queen h6, that comes next, but h3. h3 was a key move for several reasons. I didn't want her to use the g4 square. I want to play queen h6, but I don't want her knight coming into g4. I also don't want the bishop coming into g4 to trade off my knight in some lines. But the key thing is to keep her pieces from using that key square. So h3, a sort of quiet move. b6 from black. This is right standard plan for black here. She's preparing things like bishop a6. She's anchoring the c5 square. Now, I never am going to have another chance to trade it off. I'm sure she was so happy from her strategic standpoint to have prevented that freeing move c5. So b6, but it's time-consuming. Now, queen h6, very primitive but strong. All I have to do is get my knight to g5 and decoy her knight from f6 somehow. Somehow. It's easier said than done, but it can be done. 
So the idea is queen h6, knight g5, decoy the knight from f6, and mate on h7. She doesn't have enough defenders around her king here. I want to say this about the position. I think the black is okay if she plays this accurately and perfect defense. But practice is different from theory, and finding perfect defense in an actual game is not easy. So after queen h6, she played, of course, bishop a6. A very natural move, piling up the pressure on the doubled pawns, attacking my rook. What do you play here? Well, don't play what the computer recommended, because I think that's going to be a bad idea. Fritz tells you you should play rook b1. The computers aren't always right. It's just making the automatic move. In fact, sometimes human ideas are a lot deeper. So I decided that my rook belongs on the fifth rank. I need that rook for the attack across the fifth rank. And I didn't want to retreat it. I looked at rook g5. I seriously considered it. But the problem with rook g5, while maintaining the rook on the fifth rank, it takes away the square for the knight. And I need the knight on g5. So I played rook d5. This is the first of several sacrifices in this game. Very nice. So the thing is, she can't afford to take the rook. If she takes the rook, knight takes rook, c takes, or rather e takes, even better, not giving up the bishop at d3. And now when her knight moves anywhere, knight g5 comes next, and quick mate on h7. There's no defense. Black has to lose at least two pieces here for the rook, but she's probably just getting checkmated. It's devastating. So you can't take the rook. It's completely immune from capture on d5. Now she played knight e5, a good move. Knight e5 is a good move. Threatening to trade off one of my attacking pieces at, at f3, attacking my bishop at d3, blocking my rook from moving to the king side. What she didn't see was my next sequence, knight g5, doing what it looks like, doing what looks like the impossible. And this is sometimes this, the creative element in chess, what makes it so much fun. Knight g5, Offering up my pawn at c4, offering her to take the bishop at d3. So, she did. She, you know, can take on d3. In fact, she should do it right away. Knight takes d3 is the only, maybe the only move that doesn't lose for black, believe it or not. Knight takes d3 may be the only move that doesn't lose for black. After knight takes d3, rook takes d3, the move is... Queen takes c4. The problem is bishop takes c4 is no good because of rook f3. This is one of my ideas. Bishop takes c4, rook f3, destroy the defender of h7 and mate. So she has to play queen takes c4 on move 17. And by the way, skewering my two rooks. I thought I had some attacking chances here, but with a lot of computer analysis, we couldn't see everything over the board. I finally decided that the game is actually a forced draw. It's a long line, but just to show you a little bit, this is how she could have drawn the game. After queen takes c4, I have to play rook fd1. After queen takes rook at d3, rook takes d3, bishop takes d3. I have a nice little move here, which is e5. E5, forcing her to take, and now F4. And this may look crazy, but the idea is anything to try to get at the knight at F6. And the point is, if she takes on F4, bishop takes F4, black can barely defend here, but it is a draw. After bishop takes F4, we're, we're heading to E5 to, again, eliminate the defender. She's paralyzed. She can only play one move, rook c8, rook f c8, bishop e5, rook c6, also only move. Black is barely defending here. I don't think even this is good enough. I think that at some point she's going to be able to hold it, but a draw is the best she's going to get, and the only way she can get the draw is in the lines with taking on d3 and taking with the queen on c4, and taking the two rooks for the queen. You can check it with your own computers if you're really interested in this game, but it's probably a draw. But anyway, the finish of the game is fantastic. She, practically enough, thought it didn't matter. She could take the bishop whenever she wants. 
She played rook on f to c8 first. This is actually a decisive mistake. Unbelievable, but a decisive mistake. White plays f4. What my opponent didn't realize here is that mate is the object of the game, not taking material. So she starts taking material. The problem is I don't start taking back. She takes on d3. She expected me to take with a rook. I don't. In fact, white has two winning moves here. I spent about 20 minutes deciding whether I wanted to play e5 or f5. And fantastically enough, white is winning by force in both lines after both e5 and f5, both moves. And I was so engrossed in the possibilities, in the end, I literally had to almost toss a coin to try to t determine which one I wanted to play. But e5 wins a lot cleaner, and I played f5. Just to show you quickly how e5 wins very cleanly and how I missed it, let's take a look. e5, what I didn't see was, although this move is the most aggressive and direct, attacking the f6 knight, what I missed was d takes e5, f takes e5, and now black has a couple moves here. Of course, probably the only realistic one is knight takes e5. What I didn't see was rather obvious. Rook takes f6, e takes f6, queen takes h7 check, king f8, and you know what I forgot, folks? I forgot the whole reason that I played queen d2 in the first place was to give the bishop the keep thinking in some lines about that idea of bishop a3. Keep the bishop on c1 with ideas of bishop a3. And there it is. All I had to do was see the idea of bishop a3, king e8, and queen g8 mate. So e5 was utterly devastating. So this was an inaccuracy by me, but fortunately f5 wins too. So maybe it's just a matter of style here. Fantastic position. I sacrificed a piece and didn't take it back. Going all out for mate. Knight takes d3, f5 with the idea of opening up the, the f-file for the rook at f1 to eliminate the knight at f6. Now black continues to grab material. After f5, knight takes c1, an important piece, no doubt, but at too great a cost of time. After knight takes c1, I simply played f takes g6, and black does not have time or the luxury to delay recapturing with a move other than check. She has to either recapture on g6 or check. So instead of recapturing, she played knight e2 check. Let's see if she took back immediately without this check. h takes g6. Now, what does white do here to win? Very nice. h takes g6. Where's the win? It's a very funny position. Knight e6 doesn't work. It's unbelievable. But knight e6 doesn't work because of the following line. And the advanced players are going to love this. Knight e6. F takes e6. Queen takes g6 check. King f8. Rook h5. Queen c5 check. Giving up the queen but black is okay. It's an incredible position. This is the point. By giving up the queen, black is okay in this position. Absolutely amazing. Well, it turns out American International Master Vasek Rylich deserves credit for this move because I couldn't calculate this far in the game, but after h takes g6, the winning move is king h2. I'm sure he may have been aided by computer analysis, but this is amazing. I'm down a piece, and I'm simply making the move king h2, and black can't take it d5. She has no check. Later on, queen c5 won't be with check, and there's nothing to stop my threats, mainly knight e6, as in the game. The finish in the game was this picturesque knight e6 idea. After f takes g6, she played knight e2 check, king h2, 
And now h takes g6. Knight e6, the move that black missed. A beautiful shot not even sacrificing anything, simply putting the knight where it can be captured. The threatened mate at g7, as well as winning the queen at c7, and underscoring the weakness of g6. After the only move, f takes e6. I played queen takes, g6 check. Black has two choices. What can black play here? Two choices. If king h8, black will lose very, very quickly. There's several ways to win here. But the easiest is probably rook h5 check. The fantastic line. If knight takes h5, queen takes h5 check, king g8, queen g5 check, king h8, rook f7, threatening mate with queen h6 or queen g7 directly. Black's only defense, d5 check. The point of the queen on g5, blocking with e5. Blocking the check. Black has mated in just two moves after this. So rook h5, going to mate black no matter what there. King h8 doesn't come close. And fortunately, king f8 doesn't defend as well. Going back to the position, after this move, king f8 instead of king h8, the same move wins, rook h5. And it's a beautiful finish to the game where the, the rook came into play from the half-open file along the fifth rank and delivered the death blow to black on the king's side. Black utterly punished for giving up her dark squared bishop, giving white peace play. After rook h5, threatening rook h8 mate, black has only one move, d5 check. And after e5, rather than resign, she made the spite move, queen takes e5 check. But funny enough, this doesn't even stop the forced mate sequence. After rook takes e5, my opponent resigned. But the truth is I'm more than up a queen here, I'm forcing mate. After any number of moves, I'm threatening again the same thing. Rook h5, rook h8, unpreventable. Black resigned after 25, rook takes e5. A fantastic tactical game. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us at chesslecture.com. Send us your feedback and suggestions. We want to hear, we want to know what you think about this new idea to occasionally look at our own games so you can see the game from our eyes. This is International Master Bill Pascal signing out from chesslecture.com.